Uh, good morning. Uh, my name's uh, Peter. Uh, I'm IT Pilot's tools maintainer, co-maintainer with Pierre uh, Kans here. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, tools. Uh, being the tools maintainer has advantages. It means you can kind of slide things in when uh, they're convenient to you. So, Peter, sorry, are you going to share your uh, screen? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, I'm not you. all that good at tools, mind you. <laughs> Um, I have emphasised the word my here because, um, you know, these tools suit my particular workflow. You've got to be careful of um, uh, people pushing their tools onto you. They don't necessarily fit your own workflows. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll take, you know, at least one tool out of here that might be useful uh, in your uh, kind of day-to-day -day development, but they're certainly not all going to be applicable to you. So. Some of the tools here are uh, uh, particular to you know Emacs. I use Emacs as my editor. There's that not that many IDP developers that use Emacs, so we'll see. Uh, as preparation for this talk, I um, actually did what I've been meaning to do for many years. Um, so many times I tell people, "I've got a script for that," or "Why don't you use?" Oh no, wait, that we haven't got that at the moment. Uh, so as part of uh, preparation for this talk, I actually made the leap and created a repository and moved my tools in and uh, symlinked from my bin directory into this uh, tools directory. So hopefully it'll be kept you know, relatively up to date. Uh, but if you want to play it along at home, you've now got a URL. So um, Python 2 has been... Um, deprecated for well over a decade now, I believe. But uh, we have made quite an effort in, in IDPilot Pilot and related tools to continue with Python 2 support. Um, that has now just changed. In the last uh, few weeks, we've decided that uh, you can no longer rely on Python 2 uh, support in, uh, in our tooling. Uh, we already have several scripts in the IG Pilot tree, which are only Python 3, so you may have already uh, met some of the breakage. But uh, while I was uh, working uh, between the two, because, of course, our uh, auto test suite sim vehicle had to continue to work with uh, Python 2, I created myself a simple script, GoPy, and you run GoPy and give it a number, and a few seconds later, you have PyMavLink, and MavProxy installed, and your base Python version when you invoke it for a command line, all set up for this specific Python version. You can actually see that uh, the PyMavLink install isn't entirely clean under Python 2, um, but it still all holds together remarkably. So now my system is running Python 2, but we really don't want to do that. So we'll go back to 3. So this was a, a few minutes uh, work, but um, you know, it's, and it really is only a collection of three or four commands, but it makes all the difference when you need to go backwards and forwards and make sure things still work. So, incidentally, I will be doing a lot of this, jumping back, backwards and forwards, uh, demonstrating the tools. So, uh, this uh, next one's relatively recent, uh, my Go GCC, uh, which allows me to switch between different versions of uh, GCC very uh, quickly. So, I can Go GCC 4. And it's uh, created a symlink in my GCC bin directory, which happens to be in my path, to this specific version of uh, um, uh, GCC. We, of course, mainly use the GW Plus uh, compiler out of that, that directory. But you can see that there were other options in there, 4.7, 4.8, 4.9. And I can, I hope, say 4.8. And you can see now that the symlink that's created here is now for 4.8. So. Uh, you can also say release uh, to uh, use the RGPilot release compiler. Um, that's actually based off uh, symlinks, so you can actually create um, uh, favourites that you might want to use um, uh, for releases or for specific versions of RGPilot or whatnot. So, so go GCC. Uh, reset USB. Now, and this one I'm not so keen I want to run, but um, eh, we'll give it a go. So when you're working with um, hardware, hardware is finicky. It's no, no, not, not as, nowhere near as reliable as uh, SIDL, in theory. Um, 
So sometimes uh, Linux's USB system just packs it in, goes out to lunch. Um, so I have a simple uh, reset USB script, which must be run under sudo. Um, I'm going to type my password in the clear to everybody, right? And it iterates through all of the uh, USB uh, controllers in Pilot and just turns them off and turns them back on again. But uh, turning things off and run again in an automated fashion is cool. So that's uh, reset USB. So where, how this usually, um, uh, how you usually know this has happened is that you go to flash an autopilot and suddenly your music stops. My music comes via, it goes out via USB. So my music stops, I know that I have to run this script, which of course means leading over to my laptop and using its keyboard uh, and mouse to uh, actually run reset USB because a normal keyboard and mouse are no longer working. Uh, Arm NM and Arm OBS jump uh uh just um uh, well arm um, none eabi of uh none um script but just with a few convenient options so my favorite options to uh to actually see what symbols are inside uh, a binary um now honestly i didn't actually look at what these options do when i did this and that rep looks very strange but the tools went in as I use them. So uh, it looks like we're filtering to specific symbols here. So, and of course, the uh, obj dump equivalent. So, when you actually want to look at um, uh, things uh, a little bit more closely, then those um, uh, options are fairly typical when you in, uh, invoke uh, obj dump, uh, the ones you usually want to throw in to make things readable. Uh, assuming you understand assembly, I guess. Create that up the back. We need to be a box. All good. Can you explain why do you need to look at which symbols are in a binder? What do you use that script for? Yeah, we can get to that um, on a later slide. But uh, most recently, I've been using it for uh, in relation to the custom build server. So when you want to add an option to the custom build server, you need to add something to the build options.py, which is in our tools directory. Um, to know it has a companion script, which is extractfeatures.py. And it is the script which can look at the binary and tell you which features are in that binary. And that tool needs to know, needs a symbol to latch on into, into that binary and say, if this symbol is present in that binary, then you have that feature. Now, we'll talk about uh, that a little bit more later. It also helps, like, if you've written a new piece of code, it sort of, you want to know how much quick it has, you can sort of say that this function for this particular class gets this much flash or RAM or whatever as well. So, just adding that with. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of um, branch, frankly, I have a lot of branches. Um, I think I've got over 100 open PRs at the moment, at least in IDPAL, and I've got several hundred more WIP branches. So, I um, have a I need to wrangle branches fairly efficiently. And uh, these are some of my favorite tools to do with branch wrangling. So if I have a, um, a branch, which I want to do some work on, which might be a little bit, uh, how about Rover guided no GPS? If I check that branch out, I'm going to do some work on it. What I might want to do, I haven't touched this in quite some time. There's a good chance I'm going to stuff something up. But if I, I can make a trivial backup, with a simple date branch. And because branches in uh, Git are ridiculously cheap, this operation takes absolutely no time at all to run, as you can see. And you can see that the branch name is namespaced in, into the backup, it's kind of, well, I'm calling it a namespace, it's just a name, but you've got a backup namespace, and it really is just backup slash old branch name followed by a date, uh, date string. And if you have a look at through, through my um, branches, you can see that um, there are a vast number of backup branches here. So um, they're really cheap. They're out of your way. You don't have to worry about them once you've made them. But I tell you what, you don't need to uh, reuse very many of them to make it worthwhile doing this. Uh, the next one is uh, somewhat more uh, uh, time-consuming. It's date tarball. And this is another way of making a backup. 
Um, I wrote this after um, one too many uh, oopses with Git when I was first learning it. And date tarball, people are probably already guessing what it does. You give it a directory name, and after a while, you have a tar file, which is just a dated uh, file uh, correspond that has the entire contents of that directory in it. Uh, now, that one could take a while. That I oh, then again, okay. So now I have a uh, dated tarball of my RG pilot directory. Now, if I do some do whatever I do, completely stupid in that RG pilot directory. Uh, and I'll be showing a tool later, which uh, you can be completely stupid with. And if you completely destroy that, you completely destroy the .git directory. Now you've got a, a complete backup, and it does not take very long to uh, to make, as you as you saw. So I often recommend to people that if they're going to get ambitious with um, Git for the first time, under Windows, make a zip, a dated zip. They don't take uh, long to make. So uh, tar, as you can see, is very fast. So uh, now. GTO, I tend to, um, uh, I do test a lot of uh, PRs, other people's PRs, and a lot of new contributors I don't have remotes for. Uh, so I wrote a tool that makes it very easy for me to, for, for me to test other people's uh, PRs, particularly new contributors. So that's GCO. And to use this, I need to find a PR uh, somewhere here. Yeah, okay, here. So I'll go to, probably won't be a new um uh, contributor, but we'll find a. Oh, this one looks interesting. I haven't seen. I don't think I've got seen this contributed before. This UI element here. If you click on this UI element here, you can see that's the the standard kind of the copy uh, mystery meat uh, icon. So now I've been told it's copied. So if I go back to my shell and into the RD part directory again, I can GCO really and paste. And you can see that's not worked. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try a different PR. That's actually, uh, yeah, demos. I might have actually broken this moving it into the, uh, yeah, I have broken the uh, script moving it into uh, thing. what it should do. <laughs> so this is my one floor for the uh, entire demo, the entire speech, by the way. So what it would do is uh, adds the remote fetches the remote, and then uh, checks the specified branch out in a detached head state. And the detached head state you can, for, can then, for example, update your submodules and then run whatever tests you want to run in that detach, detached head state. Uh, it, sometimes you want to rework that PR a little bit, maybe fix up the commits a little bit. And you can do that all from the detached head state. So you can fix their commit message. And then I have another tool, toggle remote type, which allows me to turn that HTTPS URL back into an SSH URL. And then I can force push over their branch. And this takes very, very little of my time to actually do. So just trying to make these workflows a little bit more efficient. Then we've got rebase PRs and rebase WIPs. So as I said, I've got a lot of PRs. If I git checkout master and git pull, then I'm pretty sure I merged a PR a few minutes ago. So now I've got new commits on my master branch, but I've got vast numbers of branches that I want to keep up to date with master on the basis that if I res if I uh, fix the uh, conflicts early, then there, the, there's less code around that that is going to conflict with, so the resolution should be faster. So if I rebase all of them at once and just uh, solve the conflicts as they come up, then there's less time keeping everything up to date. So this is going through all of my PR branches and trying to rebase them. Uh, that one was merged, so it's actually just pushed uh, the branch, uh, just deleted the branch off GitHub because the branch was uh, fully merged into master, so don't no longer need that PR branch. It's deleted it locally and deleted it on uh, GitHub as well. So it's going through a few. I'm hoping for a conflict so I can actually you know, show what happens then. Uh, it's not, um, a, a lot of these are terribly hackish. So, you know, if this one does um, bomb out with a merge conflict, then I'll have to do the entire rebase from start. It has to do all of this all again. But, um, you know, often, often you can do this while you're off 
doing something else. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, no conflicts on all of those PRs are rebased. And the reason I don't have conflicts, uh, I guess, is um, I rebase early, rebase often. All right. So I also have rebase whips. So all of my whip branches. Um, so that's uh, a little bit on my branch wrangling. Come on, conflict. No. All right. Um, so efficient code editing. Um, I have done a bit of work here and there, there in the auto test suite. Uh, one of the changes I made a, a couple of years back was to uh, change it so you can set multiple parameters at once. So we used to have set this parameter, this value, uh, set this parameter name to this parameter value, set this, but then you'd have to, on another line, say, set this parameter to this other parameter value. Uh, well, we made a set parameters call. Um, so it takes a dictionary of values to set. Uh, very useful because it's fewer round trips to the autopilot because it basically just starts um, um, saying, give me this value, and if it's not what it's expecting, it says set this value, and it's, it uh, does these in parallel. So you can uh, do things uh, with the simulated autopilot faster, and it actually does make a fairly significant difference to um, uh, time, time required. Um, so the... Um, the refactoring to go from one to the other um, was just annoying. So I wrote a short filter, um, which um, fixes the old form to the new form. So I just ran that on that little code block uh, there. So you can see that this was two set parameter calls and with a, a just an application of a little filter written in um, Perl, um, it did all that automatically for me. Um, there are much fancier tools to do uh, this, by the way, semantic analysis tools and stuff, and I have played with those uh, many years ago, but this is just a very simple um, Perl uh, script which uh, takes text in and spits text out. Uh, Emacs happens to make it very easy to apply those filters to code uh, blocks in a buffer, uh, but... Uh, a little bit of research showed that you can uh, apply the same sort of thing with a uh, extension in Visual uh, Studio, for example. Uh, so the <laughs> simple Perl. Hmm. So yeah, this is the uh, code down the bottom here. Uh, I actually added the uh, comments before I committed the uh, into that new repo I mentioned. So then there's um, uh, slaughter, which I wrote many, many years ago, um, and it's it's named that way quite on purpose because um, if you stuff it up, it will like turn all of your uh, files letter for letter into the letter X, for example. Um, but you can give it a directory in which to start and a regular expression and a substitution string, and it applies that to every file in that in that subtree. I think you can filter based off. Um, um, uh, file extension. Again, it's not the only tool out there that does that. Um, there are other um, Perl-based tools actually that uh, do that, but yeah, this is the one I wrote. This is the one I'm familiar with. Uh, so other people might find that. Uh, no, I'm not going to run that uh, that tool uh, just uh, in a demo. No. Um, it doesn't actually, there's a, there's a few safety guards in there that, that try to stop you doing silly things. And there's always that bait tarball command I mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, code validation saves you time in the long run. Um, so it, took, it, it takes time to write things like these, uh, the, these pre-commit hooks. Um, but it does mean that um, before you commit your code locally, if you use these pre-commit hooks, you know that they're going to pass the CI test because it's the same tests being run um, uh, in CI, as you can then run locally. So I run the pre-commit hook. So if I um, introduce a syntax error into um, uh, here somewhere uh, for, uh, let's find a for loop and break it maybe. Uh, oh, well, we can just in introduce a syntax uh, error here, hopefully. Uh, Uh, add the patch. Hopefully, you 
you see that the um, that commit failed locally for me because I've got this pre-commit hook in place. This pre-commit hook is just a um, a symlink, by the way, from dot uh, git slash hooks uh, back into the IT pilot tree itself. Um, so it's they're kind of you can run optionally run them. We do supply them, um, but as you can see, it stopped me from uh, committing a, a syntax error. Um, if I'd pushed that up, I would have got uh, CI would have stopped it being merged to master. But this can really shorten those uh, loop times. So. Uh, now, size check uh, is actually a wrapper around size compare branches. But size check is a a really simple uh, thing which allows me to when I create pull requests show that at least on a subset of our boards, uh, board vehicle combinations, that the changes are either non-existent, zero size change, or at least small enough that it's uh, it's probable that we haven't lost a feature in IG Pilot. So if you're only trying to um, do a minor refactor and suddenly you find yourself saving five kilobytes, then that's a fair indication that you've done something wrong here. So the output here is uh, output from size check, and size check really is you just invoke it on the command line as size dash check, and eventually it spits out um, this block with uh, board in the left hand column, then target across the top here, and then the size change down in here. So in this particular case, I'll, I can actually just show you the. Um, uh, the files changed here. You can see that it's just the mount library change. You can see that over uh, over here. Um, so you know the changes should be restricted to that back end. So then you can ask yourself, do these um, um, things make sense? Star means that the output binary is byte for byte identical to what was built on what uh, on what was built on the uh, master merge brand, the uh, merge base with master. So star means identical. Zero means uh, exactly the same binary size, but there may be there's obviously some uh, change inside. Now a lot of those are, are benign. So for example, uh, in IG Pilot we were using underscore underscore line underscore underscore. So any vertical white space above an underscore underscore line underscore underscore will change the binary output. Uh, and we still actually use underscore underscore line underscore underscore in some places. Um, we have a new define underscore underscore AP underscore line underscore underscore, um, which you can use instead. And when compiling in this regime to check your binary differences, um, it sets AP line to a fixed value and a few other tweaks here and there to show to show that the binary output really is identical, even if it doesn't look like it. Uh, negative numbers are good. So this this uh, this one saves 64 bytes on uh, Durandal Copter. And of course, on a board like Sky Viper, which doesn't actually have a mount, uh, you'd expect zero size changes. And we can see that in here. So. Um, so then we've got size compare branches. Um, which size check is based on. And um, it, it's a reasonably versatile uh, tool. Um, ordinarily, you run it to, uh, you've got a branch which is based on master or based on some other branch. You can specify the merge, uh, the branch you want the merge base for. Um, it takes, a, you can specify which vehicles you want to build for, which uh, boards you want to uh, build for. But the way the way I run it, is I have a spare machine at home and I run it with uh, with dash dash all dash boards and dash dash all dash uh, vehicles. And it does this grid that you were, we were looking at, but for every uh, combination. And that takes uh, about seven hours on my, um, you know, reasonably uh, elderly now AMD 5600X. 50, uh, you know, that, that machine's a few years old now. Um, seven hours to build all the binaries on master and all the binaries on this branch and compare them. Um, now, if that's your primary work machine, probably not an option, but, you know, even overnight. It means that uh, you can have, once you've built them all, you can be sure that they all build on your branch and you can, uh, you know, eyeball it and make sure that everything's changed as you expect. 
Something else you can do is if you're uh, adding a, a feature to ArduPilot, which is, has a, a define associated with it, uh, or something you put into a HWF model of point, um, you can specify that on my on the branch that I'm um, trying to validate, apply this extra HWDEF file. So you can turn that feature off and make sure your branch compiles with it off, or you can turn it off on if it's off by default. And you specif can specify a different HWDEF file for master, or you can specify a combined one. So uh, really good code validation tool. Um, if I'm doing a... Uh, a refactor of some description or another. I'll usually run this on on it uh, on the that uh, spare machine. So the other major, uh, where I've been splitting these features out a lot lately. So um, and when you split a feature out, so that it can be conditionally compiled into Arduino Pilot, uh, we're really really liking people to add it to the build options.py script, so it appears appears in the custom build server, which I won't be demonstrating today um, because it's been done. Um, the um, buildoptions.py, uh, I can show you the, uh, what that looks like. It's not actually all that hard to uh, understand. This is the test buildoptions.py. The build options is actually in tool scripts. Uh, so if you're adding a new, uh, so uh, when I say a new feature, I'm thinking like if you're adding to the C++ code, uh, a new generator or a new uh, sensor which can be compiled out or something like that, then uh, adding uh, a feature to the buildoptions.py is a, a really easy way to uh, allow people that are on re in resource-constrained environments, so, oh, I don't know, uh, Pixel 1, 1 meg, um, still give them the option of building your feature into their board so long as they're willing to sacrifice something else or often many other things. Um, and this isn't actually all that hard to find space because um, those older boards still have vast numbers of rangefinder drivers or optical flow or um, beacon support or it's surprising what we actually still throw into those one meg boards that you can just get rid of. So um, the other day, somebody uh, wanted to run uh, Q Auto Tune on their Pixhawk 1 one meg. And that's um, the one uh, plane mode I think we don't compile in on Pixel 1.1 1 .1 meg. But using the custom build server, he could just go in, uncheck a few things, turn on Q Auto Tune, and now why you'd do that, I'm not sure why you'd want to, but you can still run Q Auto Tune on that uh, device. So reusing old hardware is good, I guess. Um, and um, this test build options is written to test that build options uh, uh, script. So the build options has a dependencies column, and that often uh, isn't correct uh, the first time you try to do things because you try to comp uh, run it, you try to compile it with um, the option enable or disable, and discover that your dependencies aren't correct. So uh, test build options tests compilation with and without the um, uh, feature built in, but um, Tests turning uh, the well, test the defaults. Um, tests turning everything off. Uh, test turning uh, everything on, and then tries every feature turning each feature off individually, and then tries turning everything off except that feature to make sure that we pull in dependencies correctly. So it's reasonably thorough, and I think the time taken uh, kind of reflects that. So. So on the code validation of all those scripts that we would, I guess, appreciate anyone who makes a pull request, we would suggest they kind of go about that to do this. How about adding those to our pull request template? You make one of So here's some links to make sure you try these. We could. Uh, the question is, um, should we modify uh, our GitHub pull request template, the uh, basically the default document you get when you start up doing a pull request uh, on GitHub, modify that to perhaps at least suggest to the uh, people that they could do this. I don't know we want to raise the barrier to entry too much um, for new users who, you know, they're struggling to get their git commit, uh, git commit uh, um, messages correct or, um, you know, pull request to the right branch, that sort of thing. We could suggest that they do it, but I think the vast majority of people just maybe just cut it out of the template anyway. 
I think would be the opposite effect because now we'll make a request just walk away and this was wrong. It's, uh, this tells you there's going to be something you can check for yourself. But there will be something in the cloud. Hmm. Yeah, um, just for the uh, just for the people listening at home, uh, uh, Tom suggests that perhaps this would make people a little bit more conscientious when making uh, pull requests to show that um, they've you know made at least a token effort to um, to test their code, uh, because we do get pull requests to our department which obviously have not been tested. They just don't compile. The person has had a good shot at it, but you know without testing. I think that's uh, one of the things that these tools do, of course, is by putting that in the PR. When I take this to dev call, it reminds me, for starters, what testing I've done on it. Um, but it also shows, you know, that it has gone through this minimum level of testing, and here's the evidence to um, to show it. Of course, the um, this uh, block uh, replaces um, what we often do on dev calls, which is we go back to the CI and click through the build sizes thing, uh, we, one of our CI steps um, shows the difference in build sizes. Um, that takes time on dev call. Um, you know, you've got 24 people all sitting there and watching, uh, you know, as as we go and uh, look through those build sizes. If we can just have it in a comment straight up here, it can save time in dev call, and that's, that's quite useful, I think. Uh, but yeah, uh, Tom, if you wanted to uh, do a pull request against the template, we can discuss it at dev call. Uh, Gather SD data is, uh, sorry, log management and analysis. Um, so I do I do uh, flying on a variety of different vehicles. Um, sorry, go on. Mm -hmm. yeah, if suppose I don't want to use the main feature, so uh, can I define that under test build options and whether that option of source code will also be compiled when making the build? Yeah, if you uh, if you uh, build options dot is only used for our uh, custom build server. There's actually a second use uh, we have for it, but yeah, just for the custom build server. If you're trying to make yourself a um, well, what we often refer to it as an OEM setup, that's where your you've got vehicles that you're trying to push out the door, and you want the same thing on each vehicle. Uh, and you want the same defaults dot palm, and you want the the, uh, the same options built in or not built at, uh, built in that sort of thing. Would usually suggest that people go uh, and you're building the code yourself. Then would usually suggest people go through the OEM setup page on our wiki, which walks you through the steps of setting it up so that when you configure the um, uh, RGPILOT for build, you actually specify your company name dash board name or vehicle name or whatever. And when you do that, um, you get all of the options you want in there, none of the ones you don't, and your uh, default stop palm. Your scripts uh, can also be uh, incorporated this way. Uh, we, if you're, So if you're a vendor pushing vehicles out, we really do recommend people look at doing that, doing things that way. Yeah. Okay, so uh, can we use this test rate options there? So suppose I don't want to use certain feature, but it's still exciting in my source code. Yeah, sure. If you add uh, if you add the option to build options dot pi, um, and then uh, run test build options, yeah, that's definitely going to work. In, in for your uh, new new uh, new feature, sure. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, I fly a lot of vehicles, um, a lot of SD cards. Uh, gather SD data is a script that I run when I'm extracting logs. Uh, the basic workflow is I eject the SD card out of the um, vehicle and attach to my laptop uh, via, unfortunately, an external USB dongle on this one, which is sad. Um, it has a, it's just got a list of known SD cards, uh, a static list in the uh, file. Uh, often I name these, give these SD cards uh, VFAT labels so that um, they're recognisable for that vehicle. Uh, gather SD data knows about the, uh, these mount points that are going to appear under Linux, uh, knows about, knows where the logs are on those and um, moves those logs from that SD card to be next to the equivalent T-log 
in my normal file system on my, on my laptop so that um, they're correlated against, the, against the, the flight, the parameters, all the stuff that MapProxy dumps into um, the uh, directory when you're flying your vehicle using MapProxy. Now you've got the bin files right next to it, which I find uh, very, very convenient. Uh, the other thing it does actually is run uh, the drone kit log analyzer against all of those files as uh, after it's moved it onto the normal file system, it runs drone kit LA against the um, those files and spits the results out to a text file. So I can review that um, uh, to see if it's actually pulled up anything interesting. Um, the other thing, of, of course, I do is I've got summary tools, which I haven't uh, included in the presentation today, uh, which go through and make um, uh, summaries of um, out, based off all of those um, drone kit log analyzer uh, outputs. So, um, so these uh, next tools uh, are in the RGPilot uh, script directory. Uh, powerchange.py, uh, du32change.py, solution status change.py, uh, and I've got a, um, a pending PR for census status change.py. So um, IDPilot in its uh, log messages had, ha, uh, has some bit masks which uh, indicate the state of the vehicle. And understanding how these have changed over time used to be quite problematic. Um, a fairly recent feature, I think, that uh, Mission Planner has uh, gotten allows you plot individual bits out of data flash log messages, which kind of makes this um, these tools a little bit um, redundant, I think. But if you point these things at um, a data flash log or telemetry log, depending on which one is applicable, then it will tell you how these things have uh, changed over time. So if we look at solution status change.py, uh, uh, if we point that, at, it's got the, uh, the bit descriptions uh, in here, and uh, it's obviously looking for a data flash log. So if I point it at a data flash log, oops, then it's now looking through the log file and is telling you how the so the EKF solution status bits changed over time. And this is very useful, actually, if you're looking at a, um, a graph from Mav Explorer. You've got timestamps where you can correlate the timestamps with these messages and you can say, okay, yeah, GPS was glitching at that point, so uh, let's have a look at our vibes, <clears throat> that sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, the... the, the um, uh, other scripts here kind of much the same. So powerchange.py tells you how the power inputs to the autopilot have changed over time. So um, many um, modern autopilots can source their power from different places. So pairs of power bricks and USB and servo rails, I guess, and whatever else. And if they're reflected in the power um, message, then this will tell you how they've changed over time. So somebody was relying on USB and they suddenly lost USB in flight. Uh, this should tell you. Um, and du32change.py is a Argicopter specific um, uh, tool which tells you how Argicopter's du32 message changes over time. Du32 is supposed to be a generic message that just has, is an unsigned 32-bit data flash log message. Copter is the only vehicle, perhaps sub as well, my, my apologies, um, that actually emits one of these uh, and by default, um, but it actually has some really, really critical information when you're doing log analysis. So uh, in particular, your landed state, I think, is, uh, is one of the critical ones in there. So um, this one tells you how that's changing over time. It Traditionally, it's been quite a bit of work to pull, to prize that one apart to work out what's been going wrong. So. Um, there is a question as to whether where these belong. Uh, currently, they're right next to um, RG Pilot, um, but you know they're heavily um, influenced by you know the Pi Madlink tools. Um, they are RG Pilot specific, so we may get more of these over time. We'll see. Oh well, that's um, a, a sudden and abrupt end. I was going to. Um, uh, show the custom build server, but um, uh, we may as well go straight to questions. Um, so I don't get it like a room full of silence. I've got some prompts up here. Uh, hopefully you can get something. 
Solar panels. <laughs> <laughs> so it's mostly piping and some pearl. Yeah, very little pearl nowadays. Uh, most people can't stomach pearl, um, but you know, for regular expression work for dealing with text, it, I really do uh, quite still like it. Yes. Um, uh, I haven't kept up with most of the recent developments in pearl. I'm, all my pearls still pearl five. Uh, right. So um, before I went completely insane. Um, nowadays, I can reach for Python as well, and uh, if I'm uh, contributing something back into the Argipilot code base, it's going to be Python because yeah, Perl is a dead language. <laughs> yeah. The GoPy, um, I've got a little Pi ver. Um, uh, it just sync links a uh, user in Python to Python 2 or Python 3 mm. and assumes you've already got it installed uh, very much, much faster. Is there a reason why you, you reinstall the Pi that link in that proxy each time? Just because I found that I was doing that at the same time. And my, of course, mine does much the same thing. It removes a sim link in uh, my squiggle slash bin directory, I think, and yeah. sim links Python 2 or Python 3 into that location. Um, just usually when I'm testing Python-y stuff, it's often Py, uh, PyMavLink or MavProxy, so it kind of makes sense. Where things do get a bit slower for silly reasons is that if you're only changing MavProxy, then MavProxy is relatively quick to install, whereas PyMavLink isn't necessarily. So, um, yeah. Continuously use your already installed smart software to get rid of all the messages, changes the link to the different file version. Yeah. It's, it comes with the like, different package, which then is saying update the items, give you the list of installed file versions, and then the same file form. Yeah. It is work magically. So it's a little bit easier to work. Yeah. Sorry, question. Yeah. Question in front here. Any tools for the path block downloading? Basically, uh, whatever the raw downloading takes, a bit much of time. So the question is, is there a tool for fast log download from the autopilot to the um, uh, to the companion computer, to the laptop? Where were you thinking of? Uh... Yeah, yeah, so we actually uh, hit the limits with the log transfer protocol when you do mission planner log transfer that way. We actually come fairly close to the limits of what we think is uh, possible with the current way that we do the USB stuff in IDPilot, my understanding. Yeah. Uh, and FTP is actually slightly slower, surprisingly, than the um, normal log transfer protocol, so, so I've been told. Um, what we sometimes recommend to people is that um, if their logs are large, if they're running big vehicles with companion computers, avoid the problem altogether and stream those logs to your companion computer and transferring them from the companion computer via Wi-Fi, via, via Wi-Fi, or um, a lot of some partners are starting to transfer them directly into the cloud while they're flying. Uh, so um, would probably suggest that at the moment. My understanding though is that. USB transfers might be getting faster uh, on more recent hardware. <laughs> that's right. And just for the record, that was um, Cube Pilot um, and uh, Crowds popping in with their. Uh, a segue into their Ethernet uh, talk, which is next. Uh, there was a question mm -hmm. online. I believe that by using simulation on hardware in my chest, I can also test the processing time. Do you plan to use simulation on hardware in the future? Uh, simulated uh, SIDL on hardware is use, useful for a great many things, but um, not so much performance analysis. And the reason that is, is that the simulation is running uh, on the same CPU cycles as um, the ArgyPilot firmware itself. Now, with, you know, multiple cores making their way into uh, ArgyPilot at some stage, it might be that uh, we might be able to do, use it for that uh, purpose. But at this point, I don't think that's uh, actually a goer. Now, that actually, though, I think does feed in with something Tridge mentioned earlier with um, performance analysis, a, um, um, a sampling 
performance analysis thing. So it might be possible in future to do that. You can do micro timing analysis in one hardware. Like doing That's true. A turn off interrupts, turn on interrupts, and blocking between, you get very accurate timing. That's true. And that works well in simulation. Uh, so great, for example, you want to know this particular function, how many microseconds this function takes. That is very accurate on similar hardware. Yeah. And I'll just repeat that for the uh, recording yeah. case it didn't get. Uh, Tridge points out that um, if you can block your code off uh, so that interrupts aren't a thing, uh, mm -hmm. you can do the sorts of performance analysis we've um, traditionally done on embedded hardware, which is um, drop in your microsecond timers around the code you want to uh, test and just read them out uh, afterwards. Uh, Simon hardware in this case really just gives you a convenient way of actually activating that code. Peter, can you talk a little bit about the requirements or um, assumptions that you're making with the tool to um, check CI before pushing? Uh, what, what environment assumptions were made there? Uh, you're referring to the pre-commit hook? Um, I believe that's limited to uh, do you have Flake 8 installed and do you have Python installed? I think so long as you can uh, run Flake 8 against a file, um, then that will pass. Um, the way that tool works, by the way, is that uh, not all of our uh, Python files in the RGPilot source tree are actually compliant with Flake 8, but very quite a few of them nowadays have a marker at the top of them saying, yes, this is Flake 8 clean. And then the this CI process we run just makes sure that it stays that way. And you know the concept being gradually over time, more things will get this, and new things should have it, so that things get cleaner over time. Yeah. So, <coughs> would this be coming checks? Uh, is it possible to flag in other third-party lint tools along with uh, the ones that you've made already? to do the checks before you commit support? Yeah, sure. Uh, the question is, can you uh, hook in uh, more tools into the pre-commit hook to make sure that your code meets, I guess, higher standards, uh, your own higher standards before actually going into your own source tree? And yeah, absolutely, that's uh, not a problem. There's a hooks directory uh, where you can just go in and uh, put in whatever uh, um, scripts you like to test your uh, code actually complies with your uh, company's requirements. Uh, bear in mind, however, that if you try to run uh, multiple things like Flake 8, they may end up fighting. Uh, so um, there's uh, a Python um, tool similar in some functionalities to uh, Flake 8 uh, called Black, I believe, um, which we kind of bounced a pull request from um, Brian from because it looked like it was just going to fight too much with um, uh, Flake 8. One of the issues with uh, Flake 8, of course, is that, and a few other things we do know in Autopilot, is that we have raised the barrier to entry, which is to say somebody who wants to help contribute to the tooling, please do, uh, now has to get over this additional hurdle of making the code Flake 8 compliant. And it can be you know, finicky at times in terms of the white space it requires, but that keeps our code quality high, so trade-offs. Also, for your gather SD data, uh, how exactly have you done the correlation between uh, your data flash log and your ESON timestamp? Yeah, yeah, okay. pretty purely off timestamp. And if you happen to have, for example, uh, SD card logs, which um, you've booted the vehicle and it hasn't ever seen a GPS or hasn't seen a... Uh, um, a GPS, sorry, GCS hasn't supplied a timestamp or a GPS hasn't supplied a timestamp, then all of your log files or those log files for that session will come in at 1980. And gather SD data just says, no, nah, not going to deal with this problem. It can't. It doesn't try to correlate past that point. Uh, it could, right? It could actually go in and have a look at the log files, see if it can actually identify the vehicle from the contents of the file. Uh, we do have, for example, parameters which you can use to identify the vehicle, that sort of thing. And of course, you look for yourself. It's all in that repository that I mentioned earlier. So, you have some users who only care about like a section of the log that you know they probably have worked into a machine and they only care like, far of the log and they want to automate the analysis of that log. And they ask all the time for discussion forums or partners who ask all the time that what's like the what's like the way to get started. So, do you have like a base script which people can look at to build these tools? 
Right. So um, Rashab's question is, how do you section a log, a large log, so that for easier analysis? Um, so you fly your vehicle for five hours and you have a one and a half yeah. inch, uh, log file to deal with. Um, our tools have, have got a lot better over time at dealing with large logs, um, but they're still problematic. So the answer is there's a few different ways to approach it. There are existing tools, of course. So there's um, Mav Extract. Uh, dot pi, which goes through your um, uh, log, supplied log file and extracts the just the parts where you are flying automatically in auto uh, into separate um, chunks uh, and does, I think, a small amount of analysis on them for you as well. This can be very handy if you've had a uh, vehicle sitting on the ground for an hour and then you've gone and uh, gone gone fly and suddenly you've got a big log for no particularly good reason. Um, second go-to thing would be probably Mav log dump with um, a condition. So you can say um, condition is um, timestamp between this value and this other uh, other value. Being a uh, Pi Mavlik style conditional thing, you're, you're limited only by your imagination, really. Uh, you could limit it to just between these latitudes and longitudes. You could limit it just to between these waypoints, that sort of thing. Um, and if you can get your head around writing uh, conditionals for um, Mav log dump, that's kind of a, a good kind of reach for tool. It's probably worth putting out the Mav extract and Mav log dump. Uh, it's quite a lot of popular tools we've heard True. Yeah. Uh, James just uh, clarifies that those two, two tools I've just mentioned are actually in the Pi Mavlink repo. Not in the Arch Pilot repo, so tools all over the place. So, as a new Arduino developer, I found that there's a suite of awesome tools like you presented here, um, and lots of pre existing ones. Is there anything that can be done to increase the visibility of tools uh, to make it easier for users to know that, oh, hey, there's a tool for that? Uh, Ron's Ryan's question and Tridge's response, but I didn't catch, which I unfortunately didn't catch. I hope the answer is give a talk at the conference. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so Ryan's question is about um, Ryan's question is about discoverability, um, and there's a I guess there's a few different answers to that. Yes, talk. Uh, perhaps we should be expanding our, our dev wiki to um, uh, to you know have a better. I did go to a bit of effort to, for example, document the auto test suite, which I haven't actually talked uh, about today because uh, I spoke about it uh, last time. Um, um, the other thing you can do is um, just have a look at what's in the tools directory. You know, just have a do an ls in there and see what it, see what it does. If it's a Python script, it'll be usually be a dash dash help. And you know, if it needs documenting, then you know. Um, but I think the, the the core answer to your question is it needs to be on a wiki in the dev wiki, easily findable. Yeah. 